This is a production of the Behavior on Clinical Medicine Department of American University of the Caribbean on Abdominal Exam and Special Techniques, presented by Dr. Gregor Polochki and Dr. Naira Chebanya. Today, we are going to show you how to perform an abdominal exam. In order to yield accurate and consistent results, you need good light and a relaxed and well-draped patient with exposure of the abdomen from just above the xiphoid process to the symphysis pubis. The abdominal muscles should be relaxed to enhance all aspects of the examination, especially palpation. You should stand at the right side of the patient. Remember that order of the abdominal exam is slightly different than other parts of the physical exam. We proceed with inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. Auscultation comes prior to percussion and palpation because these maneuvers may affect the frequency of bowel sounds. Inspection. First, we start with inspection. It is helpful to look at the patient from different angles so that you can view the abdomen tangentially. In summary, during the inspection, pay attention to skin color, presence of scars, striae, venous pattern, rashes, or ecchymoses. Try to assess contour of the abdomen. Is it flat, protuberant, or scaphoid? Look for masses or enlarged organs or any bulging flanks. Take a closer look at the umbilicus for any signs of herniation, inflammation, or eversion. And finally, watch for peristaltic waves and pulsatile masses, especially in older individuals with atherosclerotic processes. Auscultation. Next, we proceed to auscultation. Auscultation provides important information about bowel motility and bruise. Place the diaphragm of your stethoscope gently on the abdomen. Listen for bowel sounds and note their pitch and frequency. You should listen for at least 10 to 15 seconds. Listening in one spot is usually sufficient. If you do not hear any bowel sounds, you should check in other areas. Next, with the bell of your stethoscope, listen for bruies. Listen for an aortic bruie in the epigastrum above the umbilicus. Listen in both upper quadrants for renal bruies. Listen below the umbilicus on both sides for the iliac arteries. Auscultation for femoral ruies can be done now or later as part of a peripheral vascular system. In summary, these are the spots you should listen for ruies. Percussion. Next, we proceed to percussion. Percussion helps you to assess the amount and distribution of gas in the abdomen, possible masses, and the size of the liver and spleen. First, percuss the abdomen lightly in all four quadrants to assess the distribution of tympani and dullness. Tympani indicates gas in the gastrointestinal tract. Dullness suggests fluid, feces, or masses. Most examiners will percuss eight or more areas. Then proceed to percussion of the liver span. Measure the vertical span of liver dullness in the right midclavicular line as shown in the figure. Start at a level below the umbilicus in the right lower quadrant and percuss upwards toward the liver. Identify the lower border 
Odolis. Next, identify the upper border of liver dullness. Starting at the nipple line, lightly percuss from lung resonance down toward liver dullness. Measure the liver span, which normally should be between 6 and 12 centimeters in the right mid-clavicular line. Palpation. Next, we are going to palpate the abdomen. It is very helpful when the patient is relaxed and comfortable. Please remember, if the patient has a particular complaint, palpate that area last. Also, during your palpation, inspect the patient's face, looking for any sign of discomfort or pain. Begin with lightly palpating in all four quadrants, usually about nine areas in a systematic fashion. Keeping your hand and forearm on the horizontal plane, with fingers together and flat on the abdominal wall, palpate the abdomen with light, gentle, dipping motions. Light palpation is helpful for eliciting abdominal tenderness, muscular resistance, and some superficial organs and masses. Next, we proceed to deeply palpate the same areas. You may use both hands with deep palpation. We use the deep palpation technique to identify any masses, note their location, size, shape, consistency, tenderness, pulsations, and any mobility with respirations or pressure from the examining hand. Next, we proceed to palpation of the liver. The examiner's left hand should be placed under the right lower rib cage and the right hand placed below the lower border of the liver found on percussion. Using deep palpation, press gently in and up with your right hand. Ask the patient to breathe in and out deeply. And as the patient breathes in, the fingertips of your right hand should be maximally exerting pressure superiorly and deep into the abdomen. Sometimes we use the hooking technique, especially when the patient is obese. If you choose to use it, you should stand to the right of the patient's chest. Place both hands side by side on the right abdomen below the border of liver dullness. Press in with your fingers and up towards the costal margin. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. The liver edge will be palpable with the fingertips of both hands. Next, we palpate the spleen. You will put your left hand over the patient and underneath the left lower rib cage placing your right hand on the patient's left lower abdomen, pointing towards the left axilla. Have the patient breathe in and out deeply. As the patient breathes in deeply, you will gently but forcefully put pressure with your fingers superiorly, laterally, and deep into the abdomen. With deep inspiration, the spleen will descend as you are trying to feel for the spleen's tip. If the spleen is not palpated in this position, you should roll the patient to the right lateral decubitus position, repeating the above process. The last element of the palpation is assessing the width of the abdominal aorta. Your aorta runs parallel to the spine, just left of the midline. First, you should press firmly and deeply with the fingertips of one hand in the upper abdomen, slightly to the left of midline, for aortic pulsation. If you do not feel it, then move your fingers closer to the midline. 
After you've found the pulsation, assess the width of the aorta by pressing deeply in the upper abdomen with one hand on each side of the aorta. A normal aorta should not be greater than 3 centimeters. This concludes the abdominal exam. In summary, there are a few tips for enhancing examination of the abdomen. Check if the patient has an empty bladder. Make the patient comfortable in the supine position. Ask the patient to keep their arms at their sides or folded across the chest. If muscles remain tense, ask the patient to place their feet on the examining table or breathe deeply in and out for a few seconds. Before you begin palpation, ask the patient to point to any areas of pain so that they can be examined last. Warm your hands in stethoscope. To warm your hands, rub them together or place them under warm water. Watch the patient's face for any signs of pain or discomfort. Stand to the patient's right side and proceed with inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. Now we are going to show you how to perform special techniques of abdominal examination. Special techniques include assessment for peritonitis, appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, ascites, and ventral hernias. Rebound tenderness. Rebound tenderness is a sign of an acute abdomen. Ask the patient which hurts more when I press or let go. Press down with your fingers firmly and slowly and then withdraw your hand quickly. The maneuver is positive if withdrawal produces pain. Appendicitis. Assessing possible appendicitis by checking for local tenderness or McBurney's point. Right lower quadrant rebound tenderness. Rovzing's sign. Referred rebound tenderness. Soa's sign. An obturator sign. Local tenderness or McBurney's point. Local tenderness or McBurney's point. Search carefully for an area of local tenderness. Classically, McBurney's point lies on the medial two-thirds of a line drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. Right lower quadrant rebound tenderness. Ask the patient, which hurts more when I press or let go? Press down in the right lower quadrant with the fingers firmly and slowly and then withdraw your hand quickly. The maneuver is positive if withdrawal produces pain. Rosing sign. Rosing sign. Ask the patient, where does it hurt? Press deeply and evenly in the left lower quadrant. Pain in the right lower quadrant during left sided pressure is a positive rosing sign. Referred rebound tenderness. Ask the patient where it hurts and which hurts more when I press or let go. Press deeply and evenly in the lower left quadrant, then withdraw your hand quickly. The maneuver is positive if withdrawal produces pain in the right lower quadrant. Soa's sign. Place your hand just above the patient's right knee and ask the patient to raise that thigh against your hand. Flexion of the leg at the hip makes the psoas muscle contract and elicit right lower quadrant pain. Obturator sign. Flex the patient's right thigh at the hip, bend the knee, and rotate the leg internally at the hip. 
This maneuver stretches the internal obturator muscle and produces right lower quadrant pain. Acute cholecystitis. When right upper quadrant pain and tenderness suggest acute cholecystitis, look for Murphy's sign. Press the right upper quadrant at the point where the lateral border of the rectus muscles intersect with the costal margin. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. A sharp increase in tenderness with a sudden stop in inspiration constitutes a positive Murphy sign of acute cholecystitis. Assessing possible ascites. A protuberant abdomen with bulging flanks suggests possible ascites. Because ascitic fluid characteristically sinks with gravity, whereas gas-filled loops of bowels rise, percussion gives a dull note in dependent areas of the abdomen, and the central areas give tympanic notes. Test for shifting dullness. After percussing the border of tympani and dullness with the patient's supine, ask the patient to turn onto one side. Wait for a few seconds. Start percussion from the midline to the right flank. In a person without ascites, the border between tympani and dullness usually stays relatively constant. In a patient with ascites, dullness will shift in a higher level than previously noted. Test for a fluid wave. Ask the patient to press the edges of both hands firmly down the midline of the abdomen. This pressure helps to stop the transmission of a wave through fat. While you tap one flank sharply with your fingertips, feel on the opposite flank for an impulse transmitted through the fluid. Assessing ventral hernias. Ventral hernias are hernias in the abdominal wall. If you suspect but do not see an umbilical or incisional hernia, ask the patient to raise both head and shoulders off the table.